Folks, the wait is over, and iOS 11 is here. Sort of. Apple just released the public beta version of its new software to anyone that's part of its beta testing program, but we've been playing with this build for a few days now. We've gone into more detail in our full written preview, so be sure to check that out. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at some of the biggest features you'll be digging into very soon. At first glance, iOS 11 looks a lot like earlier versions, especially on the iPhone like we're seeing here. Still, the interface has changed a bit. The best example of that is the new control center, which is now a cluster of control buttons instead of multiple panes of options. Some people find it really ugly, but I don't hate it. At the very least, we can now customize what appears in control center, and we've got new options like shortcuts to the native screen recording app, which is surprisingly helpful. Oh, and you can check out all of your recent notifications from your lock screen by swiping up, which is nice, unless you're like me and never clear any of them. Remember when Apple redesigned its music app with big, bold typography? That's all over the place now. From your list of photo albums to the Messages app, big headers and titles are almost inescapable. You'll notice this new approach to design best in the new App Store, which feels a lot more editorial than it used to. Featured apps get miniature write-ups and lots of big imagery, all to help people better understand the quality and functionality of iOS apps. The games and app sections are now separate too, which is arguably better for developers in search of a big break than us. Speaking of music, Apple is turning it into more of a social network with options to share your playlists and follow other users. Those will sound very familiar if you're, say, a Spotify user like me. Unfortunately, I don't know anyone else running iOS 11, so I couldn't test how this functionality works. Siri, meanwhile, is noticeably better than she or he used to be. It's a good thing, too. The idea of a HomePod with old, slightly busted Siri wasn't great. Anyway, my Siri is female, and she sounds much, much better. She can now also respond to more arcane requests, like play me something sad, and translate things in a handful of languages. More importantly, the underlying intelligence that makes Siri work has been woven into other apps and features. Siri can, for example, help suggest news stories and things you might be interested in inside the new news app, and adds event confirmations from inside Safari straight to your calendar. You can now also type to talk to Siri, though that turns off the ability to just start talking to her in the first place. Ideally, a mix of both would have been nice. Siri still isn't perfect, though. Apple says it now pulls more answers from Wikipedia, but I find it still lags behind Google Assistant when you just have to ask it random factual questions. The camera app has gotten a boost with an improved portrait mode, though for now it's still technically in beta. You'll also find some new filters here, but the biggest deal, at least for me, were the new live photo modes. You can make these live shots loop or blur as though you were taking a long exposure. They're hilarious, and needless to say, I've been using them a lot. There are a whole lot more other things in play here, but iOS 11 on the iPhone feels so much more about evolution than it is about revolution. That's not a bad thing, since a lot of these features are welcome additions and updates, but if you're looking for real big changes, you're going to have to look at the iPads. Long story short, iOS 11 turns iPads into very capable multitasking machines. A lot of that is thanks to the dock, a new spot on your home screen where you can drop your most used apps. You can pull up the dock while you're using other apps too and either use it as an app switcher or as a launch pad to get two apps running together side by side. Drag an app from the dock into the main part of the screen and it'll start running in a thin window. Most apps I've tested work just fine in this small configuration and you can kind of move it around on screen as needed. If you really want to get these things going side by side, just swipe down on that window that locks these two apps into the familiar split view. If you swipe up from the dock, you get the new multitasking view, complete with that new control center cluster on the right. Having those extra options just plop there on the side in the strip kind of looks lousy to me, but I'm not really hopeful that'll change before release. But I digress. All of your recent apps are laid out as tiny windows in a grid, making it really easy to find what you're looking for. My biggest gripe is that you can't just swipe up on those cards to close apps like you used to. No, no. You have to long press the card and hit a tiny X to do that. The original gesture felt a lot more intuitive and elegant, so this frankly seems like a step in the wrong direction. The most surprisingly helpful new addition is drag and drop, which basically just does what it says. If you have two apps running side by side, you can quickly move images, links, or text from one window into the other. It's made sending emails laden with info and pictures a whole lot faster, 
but I just cannot wait for other app makers to get on board. Literally all I wanna do sometimes is drag a photo from the new Files app into Slack to share it, but that's just not possible yet. Oh, right, there's a new Files app. It's another one of those things that just does what the name implies. You can manage stuff you've saved directly on your iPad along with other services like Dropbox and Google Drive. Those third-party integrations are sort of theoretical right now though. Dropbox Sync is definitely not ready and navigating your Google Drive doesn't really work the way it's supposed to. It's a great idea and concept, I just can't wait to try it out when it actually works. There are, however, some great new ideas that do already work very well. Check out this on-screen keyboard. Instead of tapping a discrete button to switch layouts for punctuation and numbers and stuff, you can just slide the corresponding key down. The Notes app has been updated with the ability to scan documents on the fly too, which has literally already made my life better when I'm filing all of my expenses. And don't forget about the Apple Pencil. It was always kind of a hassle going through multiple steps before I started writing a note. Now I can just tap the lock screen with my pencil and I'm already writing. Longtime viewers might know that my handwriting sucks, but it's generally clean enough for iOS to understand it. That way I can search for things I've written straight from Spotlight. Tapping a result brings up my note and even in its unfinished state, it's honestly crazy how fast this feature works. Then again, Apple is pushing on-device machine learning in a very big way with iOS 11, so if we're lucky, behavior like this will be the rule, not the exception. Since we've only had a few days with this software, we haven't been able to test everything new here. Despite the trappings of my job, I don't have a ton of connected home stuff, so I haven't used the updated home app much. And since my car is relatively ancient, that's a no-go on CarPlay. Similarly, I couldn't try making Apple Pay payments through iMessage or sharing Wi-Fi connection details because I don't have anyone else testing iOS 11 with me. Other features, however, just aren't ready, like multi-room support in AirPlay 2. And while we're starting to see some really neat augmented reality tricks made with ARKit, none of those are technically available in the App Store yet. We'll continue testing iOS 11 right up until its official release in the fall, so stay tuned for much more.